Okay, good morning again. I'm Kevin Quinn. I have to tell you that we are very fortunate this morning that the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy and the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard are here with us to share their thoughts about the future of their respective services. It's important to note that the Surface Navy Association is not just for officers, but for all the officers and enlisted members of the seagoing services who operate the nation's great ships in our home waters and around the world. McPon Mike Stevens has been in the Navy for over 30 years and became the 13th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy on September 28, 2012. He previously served as Command Master Chief for the Second Fleet and Fleet Master Chief for Commander U.S. Fleet Forces Command. So he knows his way around the waterfront. Thanks for joining us here today, McPon. Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard Levitt has had a distinguished career in the Coast Guard, rising quickly through the ranks to Master Chief and assuming his current assignment on 21 May 2010. He's had a broad array of operational assignments at duty stations from Hatteras Inlet, North Carolina, to Maui, Hawaii, and has a deep understanding of every facet of the Coast Guard. Thank you for joining us today, Mick Pog. With that as introduction, I'll turn it over to Mick Pond Stevens, and we'll get started. Mick Pond. Okay, is my mic hot? There we go. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Surface Navy Association for the opportunity to come out here and, and share a few words with you, and more importantly, uh, to have a conversation. Uh, so please, I ask that uh, we make this a robust discussion. Don't be afraid to ask us, well, just about any question you want, but some of them are probably off limits. But uh, thanks again for being here. Uh, before I get started, uh, I'd first like to say uh, that it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with my good friend and neighbor. Uh, we live in the same little cul-de-sac together, uh, Mike Levitt. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge that uh, Mike is getting ready to retire here in a couple of months after... Uh, over, I think, 32 years in the Navy, right, Mike? You're retiring? Yeah, over 32 years. Th Coast over 32 Guard. years, not in the Navy, in the Coast Guard. Yeah, Coast Guard. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's easy to say Navy, right? So 32 years uh, in the Coast Guard. He's got, if you read Mike's uh, bio and, and get a chance to talk to him, he's just had a phenomenal career, uh, one that most people will never have the opportunity to experience. So he leaves, uh, he leaves the Coast Guard in capable hands. Uh, and has done a magnificent job. It's been a pleasure to be uh, considered his friend, uh, his neighbor, and uh, and to have Mike and uh, and be able to serve as his counterpart. So thank you so I'm much. Thank Let's you, give Mike. Mike a round of applause for that. Right. The only bad thing is, is his wife Deb likes to shop, and my wife likes to shop, and they get together, and <laughs> and it, it kind of puts a dent in our wallet. But we seem to we seem to manage. Uh, so I'm, this is Thursday of a five-day uh, symposium, and you've heard, uh, many of you have heard lots of speakers come up here. And so you've got to ask yourself, what are you going to come up here and talk about that, there's a, you know, that you haven't already heard from the other speakers? So I'm going to focus mostly uh, on the enlisted force and kind of the tone of the force, the things that I see as I go out and about and, and engage with our people. Uh, and then talk about some of our concerns and where some of our priorities lay, and then uh, turn it over to Mike, and then we'll move into a, a question and answer period. So you may know this, but I'm going to share it with you anyways. Right now, the, the Navy as a force is 324,000 strong. Uh, the good news is uh, there's no plan right now, unless you know uh, the budget requires us to, but there's no plan in place to draw the Navy down any smaller than that. We believe that this is where we need to be to execute the mission that we have. Of course, there's always unforeseens, uh, and so we could, you know, you could see a drawdown or you could see a plus up. You just don't know. But that's where we're at right now, and we've been pretty steady in that place for a while. Uh, of those uh, 324,000, 265,000 of those members are the enlisted force, E9 and below. This is kind of an interesting bit of trivia, but it means a lot when I think about this because I remember where we were and where we are. Of the 265,000 sailors that we have in the enlisted force, 4,134 of them hold bachelor's degrees. Uh, right now, we are as we recruit sailors coming in, I think it used to be a prerequisite not to have a high school education. 
right? But right now, 98.6% of all our enlistees possess a high school diploma or a high school diploma equivalency. Well, you have to have a high school diploma equivalency to come in, but a diploma, 986 the Navy will bring you in right now with a 35 AFQT on your ASVAB score. So that's your total score. But when I talked to a recruiter the other day, what I found out is that you, you, you actually qualify to come in with a 35, but you're probably not going to get in with a 35. You have to score a 50 or better uh, to really be eligible for any of the openings that we have. And even when you score a 50 or better, you're going to be on a substantial waiting list. What is a 50? Well, we consider a 50 to be upper mental group, right? Upper mental group. So 89.1% of our sailors that are coming in the Navy today, so nearly 90%, are scoring better than a 50 in the upper mental uh, uh, aptitude of the ASVAB. That's pretty darn impressive uh, because we've never seen that before, but that's the caliber of people that we have coming in, and many of them that are coming in possessing bachelor's degrees and associate's degrees and and what have you, uh, and they're making the decision to serve in our Navy. So we feel pretty good about that. And we're bringing in about 40,000 new accessions every year. So 40,000 leave, about 40,000 new folks come in. So the old blood like myself and, and Master Chief Garrison sitting here in the front, you know, we get flushed out because we didn't have those 50 AFQTs and we're bringing in the smart kids to replace us, right? I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that we don't do it alone. It's not just a uniform service. We have 195,000 civilian sailors that serve in the Navy and do a remarkable job, and without them, we simply can't do what we do. Let's talk for just a minute about individual augmentees. If you, many of you remember when we started in the IA business that it had a pretty significant impact on our manning and our ability to do our job. I know we have people in the audience now that saw a lot of their force get pulled from our, our combatant units and our other surface organizations and have to go serve IAs and it, impact, it in, uh, impacted Manning. In 2012, we had 6,812 sailors serving in individual augmentee billets. In 2013, that number dropped to 4,300. And today, we have 3,553 sailors serving as individual augmentees, mostly in Afghanistan, uh, but there are some folks that are plugged in in other places around the world. That's a 48% reduction over the last three years in individual augmentees. Uh, so we've been able to bring those folks back in and get them to those units that are Navy specific. What's important to remember of those numbers that I just shared with you today, 85% of them come from the reserve force. So the reserve force, our reserve Navy, is really, if you will, bearing the brunt of our individual augmentee billets and doing a magnificent job. I can remember when you could tell the difference by talking with a reserve and an active sailor, you could literally tell the difference. Today, you can't tell the difference. Over the last 12 plus years, uh, the way that our reserve and active force is integrated and operated, uh, it's really one and the same. And I, I hope in the future we can find a way to continue that uh, relationship with our reserve force because it's that important. A couple of things that I want to talk to you about that are near and dear to my heart that uh, we've, we have faced challenges with over, the, over many years, uh, number one being suicide. Uh, suicide has been, is one of those things that has a significant impact, not just on the families, but on the Navy and our Navy families. Uh, it's a tragic event when it occurs. Uh, it, it really impacts readiness. It impacts the morale of our units. And we feel very passionate about getting after this, uh, this, this topic, this subject of suicide. Uh, the good news is we're seeing the trends come down. It hasn't happened all by itself. And we've seen, actually, we've seen significant progress. But it's happened because leadership at the top has recognized it, number one, as being an issue. And number two, we've put measures in place to really get after it. Uh, we have stood up uh, an organization called N17, which is a 21st century sailor office. Uh, we have a, a flag officer, that, uh, Admiral Buck, who runs that. And his sole focus, not sole focus, one of his primary focuses uh, is suicide. 
And the way we're going after suicide is through a program or a process we call resiliency. And he released an editorial the other day that I just wanted to read a quote out of it because it really kind of nails down what resiliency is. And he says, more specifically for suicide, resiliency represents the process of preparing for, recovering from, and adjusting to life in the face of stress, adversity, trauma, and tragedy. So these are trainings like operational stress control and other trainings that we do uh, that are mandated, and some of them are voluntary, that we've been rolling out to the fleet and having the discussion. And we've seen our numbers drop from last year to this year, about 19, I think it is. Uh, so we've seen 19 less suicides this for, for uh, 2013 than we saw for 2012. But you don't want to pat yourself on the back because suicide is one of those things that's really it's an unknown. We think we understand it, uh, but if we understood it, uh, we wouldn't have a problem if we understood it completely. Uh, so we continue to work on that, and, and we're, very, we're optimistic, but we're optimistically cautious. So we'll continue to work on that. Second, you've heard a lot of it, and rightfully so, because this also is a tragedy. It's a crime. Uh, it's, it undermines, again, the very fabric of who we are as an organization, uh, and that's sexual assault. Uh, sexual assault is, uh, is going to be the challenge of our times. You know, CNO and I have talked about it, and, and he sat down with me and said, Mick Pond, you and I will be working on this uh, with all our heart and soul the entire time that we're in office, and then whoever relieves us will have to continue that on because it's not going to go away completely anytime soon. Uh, what we can hope for and work towards is continuous progress every single day. And we're doing that first and foremost through awareness. Uh, our sailors understand what sexual assault is. They understand how to report it. Uh, and they understand uh, bystander intervention. And the Navy is providing the requisite necessary training to ensure that all those pieces are in place and remain in place. Uh, so we're going to continue to work on that uh, every single day. I will tell you that I believe, because my number one focus area is the Master Petty Officer of the Navy has been developing leaders. Because I believe whether it's suicide or sexual assault or any of the other challenges that we face, the best weapon system against that enemy, any of those enemies, is good, sound, solid leadership. And leadership doesn't happen all by itself. You have to put effort into it. Uh, so we're working in many different areas to increase our ability to lead because let's be honest with one another. No organization will ever be better than or rise above the capabilities of its leaders. So if you want to tackle these issues, then you must improve your ability to lead. Every generation must do that. And, and I hope you got some questions for me on leadership because I have a little bit more I'd like to talk to you about on that. You've heard from our senior leaders that we're shifting our focus, not really shifting our focus, we're shifting some of our force, I should say, from the Atlantic side to the Pacific side. You've heard of the Pacific pivot. Uh, so right now we're about a 50-50 split, and in the future it's going to be more of a 40-60 a split. The Pacific is going to see more forces as we continue to uh, increase our ability to operate in that area. We're doing that with 283 ships and 3,700 aircraft. On any given day, we have 50,000 of our sailors that are underway, which equates to about, and units, it equates to about 35 to 40 percent. I didn't say deployed, they're, they're underway. Uh, but when a sailor's underway, uh, they consider that deployed in many ways, right? Uh, the uh, the uh, surface boss, the Force Master Chief Knox, who's with us today, he talked about uh, there's an 8,000 shortfall in the surface force, gaps at sea. Uh, which equates to about 15% of their total billets. And he, he shared with me that his concern is how that impacts our ability to operate because we're missing those critical skill sets. Because most of the time, those gaps, those are gaps in critical skill set areas. Women in combat. So we've made a lot of progress in that area, but I got to tell you, uh, the Navy's been working on this for a long time. For many, many years, we've had openings, lots of openings for our women to serve in combat roles at sea, and we just continue to open up more uh, areas for them to uh, serve in. Just recently, 291 billets were opened up in our coastal riverine groups. 
Uh, we are now putting women on submarines. We already have a number of our female officers working or, or serving on board our SSBNs and SSGNs. In 2015, we will have uh, officers, female officers, on our Virginia-class submarines. And in 2016, we plan on putting enlisted sailors, women, on our Virginia-class submarines. I got to tell you, that, that part of it is uh, moving faster than I expected it to. When I first heard about this, you know, women on submarines plan, I thought that this was going to be something that was going to take a considerable amount of time to do. Uh, but the CNO is committed to it. The submarine force is committed to it. And they put the right leadership in the right place at the right time. Uh, and they've made tremendous headway on this. So this is exciting times for our women to serve uh, in the Navy because of all the opportunities that are out there. Uh, you might have heard CNO talk a little bit in his speech about quality of work, quality of life, and how we need to work on that to ensure we have the proper quality of service. I'm not going to get into that too much, but if you have any questions, he and I talk about that all the time. I just testified yesterday, or I wouldn't call it a testimony. It was more of a discussion with the, uh, the uh, military pay and compensation uh, committee uh, that was put together to provide recommendations to the president. And we talked a lot about that particular topic yesterday. Last year when I spoke, I said my focus area is something I call zeroing in on excellence because there's a lot of things that kind of tug and pull on my time. And I always feel that it's important to be grounded in something that you can always go back to and continue to work on so that you maintain your focus on what it is that you want to do to support the CNO in his warfighting tenets. So my zeroing in on excellence is still after 16 months in the job, number one, developing leaders, number two, good order and discipline, and number three, controlling what we own as sailors. Uh, and again, I stand ready to answer any questions on those topics, but I don't want to get into it now out of, this, uh, uh, out of the spirit of time. Well, thank you for the opportunity to kind of give you a general lay down of our force and some of the things that are on my mind, on our CNO's mind. And I look forward to and hope to have a robust uh, Q&A session after the MCPOG is done talking. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice job up there, shipmate. I'm not sure if it's good morning or good afternoon right now. <laughs> Admiral Parker, it's great to have you here. And Admiral Robigo, it's always great to see you. I think you've been to every one of these events with me out here. The, uh, I'm going to start off with a video here because I just kind of like to show everybody kind of a little bit what the Coast Guard does because you're going to find out with our 11 mission sets we have out there, one of those is a member of the Armed Forces. And I kind of like it juiced up a little bit because every time I see a ship underway or a small boat underway, I just want to get out there and get underway. It goes simple. I'd like to start off by thanking the SNA for, for inviting us here to let us talk about our story just a little bit with, our, with my counterpart. And, and Master Chief, I echo all the same to you in, in regards to that friendship out there. We, the one thing you all need to understand is when that room shuts, and you, with your, with, with, whether you're the tank with the service chiefs and the chairman or with lunch here soon with the uh, Secretary of Defense, it gets pretty heated up there sometimes. And it's great to have, what do you call, you call them battle buddies? But it's great to have them right alongside you out there. Uh, and we'll watch now for our workforce. The, uh, this last four years, you did, bring up, you, you did bring up that I am retiring in May. And just for your own information, if you haven't heard, the Commandant, the Vice Commandant, and myself will all be retiring this year, which brings on a whole new leadership team. And I would suspect uh, the challenges aren't going to change. Maybe the direction of how we tackle those challenges may change in some sense. And as you know, the budget drives a lot of those things. So I'd like to start off with a video. If you can go ahead and roll that. And then, uh, and I'd like to keep it short because Mitt Pond's already hit a couple things. And, uh, and I'll, touch in the, uh, I'll hit the gaps in between. 120 years. We've been everywhere America's needed us to be. We're on scene today, adapting for tomorrow, and always ready. This is our chosen profession. This is our way. This is what we do. We are the men and women of the United States Coast Guard.
Hey. I don't know if I need to say anything else. I think we're done. <laughs> hey. The National Security Cutter and the Fast Response Cutter, those are great ships. Great ships. And the crews are really enjoying those ships out there. You know, the... Uh, we took on a lot of challenges. It's going to be hard to sit there in a forum like this, say what the challenges are. But I got to tell you, when I first took this job, probably the number one challenge I had at that particular time was how do we manage the workforce? You know, we walked in there, about 96, 97% retention. Nobody's getting out. And as, as Master Chief had just mentioned here, the quality of people we have coming in, what's that fair opportunity to make sure they get to the top? And these are really, and these are difficult decisions because you manage the whole workforce, not one end of it, not the other end of it. So you got to kind of manage the whole thing, and then, and then, and then, how do you deal with that? And so, uh, when we first took this job, we had to take a look at. Now well, we went mirrored up with the Navy just a little bit with the career attention screening panel. How do we do that? And, and I think you're all, thank you, folks, for that because there's some good there, there were some good things and some good nuggets in there that we used. And then we kind of pushed forward and tailored to the Coast Guard. But you know, whenever you put a program out there like a career attention screening panel, there's a human side to those things. And that's the part that, that most of us feel out there, the part that every command master chief is going to have to answer when that member and, and their family are heading out of the service. But these things have to be done when you want to manage that workforce to meet the future needs of what you got going on out there. So the current attention screen panel is what we threw in to, to help manage that piece right there. But we realized, you know, a little later on that that wasn't going to be the only thing, the only tools can help us manage it because, because the cost of doing that, let me, let me back up one notch. The one, thing, the one thing different from the Navy and from the Coast Guard, it's just right out of boot camp how we start off. See, we don't start off going right to a specialized school with any type of rating. Most of us, most of us start off right in the field, so we go out in the field as non-rated personnel, no designator. So it's important to know that. But there's certain, and I think it's important to our people go out there and serve in the field at that E2, E3 level, uh, just so they can understand what it's like to get, you know, understand what it's like to stand the watch, get wet, get seasick. You know, learn those duties and responsibilities of coming a petty officer. But then there's a certain point in time when you didn't feel too long. And in some of our cases, we have people out in the field over four years. And by then, their enlistment's already up, and we're losing a great opportunity. So those are a lot of those reasons behind why we had to do these things. But anyway, the career attention screen mechanical was based off nine buckets that we put out there. And if you fell within these nine buckets, you know, that you, 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 you involuntarily re retired. And we dealt with retired folks out there. So that's how we dealt with the, top, the upper end of the workforce out there. But the one problem we had with that is we really didn't have an established line of folks that really needed to leave the service. Obviously, when a master chief leaves, there's a sequence of events for different advancements. But, uh, but it's hard to count what those things are going to be. So we had to initiate the high year tenure. And we just did this this last year to put it in place. And, um, and that's tough. I lost a lot of hair off that. You know, trying to figure out. I, mean, I came in, I came in just like Captain Jones with a whole head of hair, and you can see what I got now. But, you know, like I said, there's a human side of things. So how do you implement a higher tenure out there to make sure it's the right thing at the right time, you know? Because what you don't want to do is send folks out there destitute, you know. You've got, you got to be mindful of these things. So if you provide waivers, whatever it might be. So, uh, so we implemented it. And, and, and we'll, some of these Coast Guard men out here been out here in the mid-'90s. We saw how we did it in the mid-'90s. And it was, in some cases, it was what we had to do at that time. No criticism of how they implemented it. They had to do it at that time. But we can learn out some of the things that, from the 90s and how we implemented this. And we did add a few more human pieces to it, I thought. And we didn't go out there and just go, whack, this is how it's going to be. Because back in the mid-90s, you've got to remember, we had people that had been in 40 years. So you have a 40-year master chief running around out there, and the, and the senior chief's got 35 years waiting for the master chief to die. You know, it's kind of what it was back in those days. And we lost the whole upper end of our workforce and a lot of the, a lot of the experience on there. So anyway, we, that's a challenge. But we put those tools in place. And I'm, I'm happy to stand in front of you right now with great leadership from our Coast Guard to say that these tools are starting to work. The, uh, our A schools for the average right now is about 22 months. So we're moving that down about from three years to about 22 months. And we think about next time I'm standing in front of you. I won't be standing in front of you next time about this time, but it's going to be 12 months, we're probably going to knock off that time frame. Now, obviously, there's some ratings out there that I'm really concerned with, and there are traditional ratings that have always been slow when it comes to going to, to A school, and those ratings are the, uh, some of them are the uh, AMT, AET, the uh, MSTs, the HS ratings, and these things are real important. But, you know, even more important, though, is, is making sure that when our folks come out of recruit training, that our, our, that our leadership is right there right alongside them, talking to them, keeping them energized, keeping them focused on the right things. And so the, the, the goal we had put in place, at least the goal I had, was, was, in, uh, was success, 
uh, success depending on the leadership within the Chiefs mess. Success for our people, success for our missions, depending on that leadership. So every goal that we put down in our office, whether it was to work on the curriculum at the Chiefs Academy, which we completely updated, our, our leadership management course that was geared towards E5s, and our senior, senior list of leadership course, which is geared towards E8s and E9s, it's all been updated. That's, I can proud to tell you, some have been updated in over 20 years. And, you know, it, and, and it, it's just what it is. Sometimes you do master chief faults and you move a piece here and there. We forget on the ADDIE model. There's an E on it. You have to evaluate your curriculum from time to time. So I think it's good. And, our, and some of the challenges I saw when I first got there is the Chiefs Academy was more based off of uh, lead and self. And I think most people in this room would recognize that chief petty officers and above lead others. You know, we lead change in performance, and sometimes we lead the Coast Guard. So those are some of the challenges we had in that realm right there. So we instituted that. But, you know, the commandant came out. You know, he'll, he'll tell you, well, we took a fix on the Coast Guard. We've got to figure out where we've got to go first. But, but he said it to me in simple terms. And it's as any sailor can understand. Any Coast Guard can understand this. You know, and, and I, I've commanded several different units in the Coast Guard out there, and, and they really resonated with me. If we're going to get through some challenging times, the budget's going to create those, and they're going to continue to do that. The first thing you've got to do is have a clear direction for your workforce. And to and get through those challenging times, you need to have a crew that's well-trained, excuse me, well-equipped, and proficient at what they do. And you have to, and along the way, you've got to make sure you've got the programs put in place to take care of your shipmates and their families. So let me back up in one notch on well-equipped. You saw that last cutter on our national security cutter, fast response cutter. Well, let me tell you, imagine Admiral Parker probably talked a little bit about this, about trying to maintain a 50-year-old cutter. What I see when I go visit those units, having been on the bot, well, I think she was almost 30 year old, almost 30 then. Um, this is what the crews are going through. I know the Navy's looking at me, 50 year old cutters, you've got to be kidding me, and, and older. Look at what your crews are trying to do. There's a loss of operational days, resource hours. That's number one. That's going to happen because you're trying to maintain an old ship like that. But we're really the human side, what's happening to us down in the deck plates is our people are spending a great deal more time in the engine room working hard. Your deck force is spending more time trying to keep the ship from rusting apart and doing those types of things and then taking care of the equipment on it and the cost of maintaining that. You imagine a 50-year-old car right now trying to go buy a part for that? Can you find it? Most of them have to be machine fab. So if you add all those things, what's that mean? Well, that means you lose a little bit of that balance. If you're down there working on the engines, doing all these other things right there, that takes you away from training. And if you're not training as much as you should out there, it takes you away from being proficient at your job. And ultimately, it takes you away from your family much longer than you need to be away from your family. So those things concern me, too. So, and on the other front, let's take a look at some of our programs. We identified three things, housing, housing, child care, and ombudsman program. We thought we could take a bite out of those three things and control them. And we had about roughly 4,000 housing units when we first took this job. And, and I've, been, I've stayed at a lot of different housing units. I have never been stationed at a very large unit. I've been, in, like a lot of other Coast Guard men, at stationed at very remote, high-cost areas like that. So you're dealing with those housing challenges. But we had 4,000 houses out there, and, and no knock on anybody, but a lot of it was hand-me-down housing. And it wasn't really probably adequate to start with in some cases right there. We're trying to maintain it, but that's the other thing that we don't have a lot of money for is infrastructure, and it's going to be some challenge we're going to take on in the future. And so we're trying to deal with these things. And so we got authorization to actually sell some of our housing and, and divest our housing and try to get that money back into housing we need. So 4,000 houses, how many houses do we really need? You know, so that, and that's what we're looking at right now. And I, and I, and I think the number is going to be roughly about 2,800 houses, 2,700 houses right now, ballparks, what we're going to need. And, uh, and it's the right thing to do. But more importantly is how we manage our housing. So we did so many different changes on the upfront central management system to uh, – uh, to look at all housing from one, one lens instead of 20 different lenses. What's in, you know, so that, that's a really important piece about that. And then just to focus on housing. The child care, you know, it helps when you put a little bit of funding in there to start with. You know, we went from, I want to say, a couple million to nine million, and that helps subsidize a lot of our folks to be able to use it. And what I did notice is that a lot of folks actually started using other child care services. So they're dropping our CDCs, the nine CDCs that we have in the whole Coast Guard. Excuse me, seven CDCs we have in the whole Coast Guard. And that, that, that it dropped, but rightfully so. People are using, you know, they're using those subsidies the way they should be. And the ombudsman program, I'm, standing, I'm proud to stand in front of you and tell you we have over 400 volunteer spouses out there that are, that are ombudsmen today. And I think that's really important because nobody can tell you the story from the spouse's point of view better than the spouse can and what the real challenges are out there. So we're working on those fronts out there. The, uh, I'm really happy with the work-life program. I'm not, I'm not much of a computer guru. But uh, our health and safety and work life came up together with an app. 
And this app is so helpful for our, for our Coast Guard. I was going to bring it up here, but I told the mic's not going to work if I brought it. And even I can access this. See, what we did is we had an old, what they called an OEAP. It doesn't really matter. What we have today is CG support. And I am so proud of that CG support. And all our members should be using CG support. The, uh, in that, we got some education, finances, uh, suicide, all the, different all, all the different counselors you can seek. For whatever, almost, almost anything you can think of that's in there today, up to 12 counseling sessions and things like that. But all of that is included on this web app I'm telling you about. Because if you want to know where you're going to get stationed at, there's a transition piece on there. It's a one-stop shop, and we finally have it. It took years to get it. So what I guess I'm trying to say as the end, at the end of sum this all up, is that uh, we have made some headway. We got the, on our national security cutters, we, we want to try to get eight. And I'm going to tell you that number eight is going to be a battle for whoever the next leadership team is going to be. It's going to be a battle, and that's a battle we've got to take on, because those eights can replace 12. And you all know you can't be 12 places with eight shifts, but we're going to take a look at that. Uh, but we're making, we're, we're making headway. We have three out there right now. We've got the Bertoff, the Weishi, and the Stratton. And see, they're running. The, I think we just, uh, the First Lady, Coast Guard Lady, just christened the, uh, the Hamilton, and she's in there. I believe we're getting ready to commission our eighth, NASA, our, our, eight, our eighth fast response cutter, which is named after enlisted heroes. So we're making some headway in all these realms, as you can see. We're, we're updating our, we've already updated our, updated our aviation community, and we're continuing to work on that realm, and as well as our boat forces community. And as you can see, at our work, our work life community. And those things are really important. So the future of our force should be no surprise to anybody. If you're going to ask me what the future of our force is, it's going to be about how we balance modernization and readiness with what our pe people needs are. Because at the end of the day, regardless of what our challenges are ahead, it's always going to be come down to our people. And so I think I'm going to go ahead and end right there. And, and I did have a few things on my mind. And Mick Bob did cover it. Let me throw one thing that's on my mind. Is that diversity is something that the Coast Guard needs to continue to work on in the future. That's going to be a challenge and peace out there. And I did write one other thing down in here is um, alcohol abuse. Alcohol abuse is something that we all need to take a look at. Because I think as I take a look at the arrest reports every month, domestic violence DUI at all different levels and all different grades. It's obvious that alcohol is an issue in our services. And the one thing that Mick Pond and I both share, all services share, is the exact same personnel issues and challenges. So I go ahead and stop right here and thank you for your time. Look forward to questions. Mick Pond, I'm H1 Santa Maria from USS Curtis Wilbur. I have a question on CPO 365. Is there a second year of phase CPO 365? Is it at the place where you envisioned it? And if not, how do you see it evolving over the next few years? It's uh, actually, we're at a place, a better place today than I anticipated that we would be. Uh, the reason is, is because of our CPO messes and our first class petty officers and their willingness to embrace it. So for those in the audience who are unfamiliar with CPO 365, it's a training process that we have in place that uh, does two things. Uh, first, it prepares and better trains our first class petty officers to be work center supervisors and leading petty officers. Second, if they're selected to become chief petty officers, it prepares them better to enter into the CPO mess. It's a year-round training process. It's not something that we just do a few weeks or a few months out of the year. It's a continuous process. We say that there's a start and stop, and you know we pin on the 16th of September, and then on the 17th we start CPO 365. But really what we do is we go from phase one to phase two back to phase one. And it never really starts or it never really stops. It's a continuous training process. But uh, its success is going to be... Uh, completely dependent upon our chiefs and our first classes and their willingness to continue to engage. So I'm very, very happy with it. Uh, I think it will continue to evolve. Uh, we made a few tweaks to it this year, uh, but nothing substantial. Uh, change is necessary for any organization to get better. If you don't, if you don't seek change and you'll stay the same or you'll get worse. Uh, and so I'm confident that CPO 365 will continue to change and continue to evolve. Uh, but I want to be careful that we don't change too much because too much change too fast is, is actually can be worse than no change at all. Uh, so CPO 365, we're real proud of it, and we look forward to continuing to work with our CPO mess and first classes in the future. Does that answer your question there, Petty Officer, first class? All right, thank you. 
Good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for coming to, uh, to speak to us. I'm Lieutenant Junior Grade Becca Kanivak. I work for Admiral Roden and OPNEV N96. Uh, Mick Pond Stevens, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. I heard you at uh, the Sea Service Leadership Association earlier this year, or I guess last year, and right. it's just fantastic. So yesterday, Admiral Gordon, you kind of unveiled and spoke at length about his optimized fleet re response plan. One of the lines of efforts he talked about specifically was manning and individual training, and one of his desired end states that he gave to us on his uh, our knee boards was to, quote, incentivize and retain quality sailors. And I was wondering if you could speak about what programs or initiatives are underway, uh, or like maybe even in the planning stages, that are meant uh, to achieve that goal, specifically with respect to incentivize. Right. So there's tangibles and there's untangibles, right? So the tangibles will be uh, monetary incentives. Uh, where we believe uh, we need to, uh, at what point in a person's career, at what skill set, at period, you know, how long a person is at sea or on sea duty, uh, our uh, fleet commanders, our type commanders, and our OPNAV N1 will take a look at that and determine how we pay our people. Uh, because it's important, right? So we're going to incentivize through pay. We've always incentivized uh, at sea through, through promotion. When you look at first class petty officers and above and those selection boards, we place a lot of value on at sea time. Uh, it's, it doesn't even have to be in the precepts, it's assumed. When those master chiefs sit that board, they recognize that sea duty is important and our folks that are out there doing the heavy lifting in that area uh, typically get the nod, uh, you know, when it comes to, it doesn't mean it's all inclusive, doesn't mean that people at shore don't promote, but if you just look at our track record, you'll see that folks promote better uh, that are at sea. And we recently did a study, not just with our boards, but we find that our sailors that are taking exams, they also promote at a slightly higher rate than our sailors at shore because they're typically working in their rates and are more familiar with the test questions that come out. So those are some of the things that we're doing. But I think another way that you incentivize is by making sure that you're putting the right leaders in command, creating the environment, the culture that encourages sailors to go to sea and to serve. It's not just important that we do that afloat, but that we also do it ashore, which is why the vice CNO, the CNO, our fleet commanders have put a lot of effort and a lot of energy into the command leadership school up at Newport, Rhode Island, uh, so that we are better preparing and training our commanding officers, our executive officers for uh, time, you know, for their operational command. That's great, thanks. I'll yield the floor to you, but I actually have a second question. Okay. Uh, I'm Ted Kay. I'm uh, an old SWO from a long way ago, but I want to ask a question because I know I'm supposed to be a recruiter just as, as everybody else is. Mm -hmm. And I posed that question to myself as I heard you were talking, and I said, okay, if I was going to talk to a young man and woman, how would I describe his or her career as an enlisted person, an officer, doesn't matter, uh, through uh, gaining and going to sea, being in a squadron, and going through the type of technical skills they might have, what home ports they might visit, what foreign places that, you know, back to the, uh, the Navy is, is, a, is an adventure. And how would you package that up uh, to the way we hear news from the Navy saying, well, USS, you name it, is just back from a nine-month deployment, and, uh, and oh, by the way, we're going to rotate and, and put lots more forward presence in the Pacific. And so how would you couch all that when you're describing that to me, it was an adventure to, that, to a young person looking to go into the service and gaining some skills and learning about life and experiencing things. How would you describe that to him if you were you or me? So years ago, I was a recruiter, so I got this one right. <laughs> I, uh, we have to be careful. We we gotta we cannot assume that these young men and women that are signing up are not looking for a challenge because I will share with you that they are looking for a challenge and there is no better recruiting policy than to just be honest. When they come in the door, you tell them, you tell them, hey, the, the Navy has a tr it provides tremendous opportunity, but make no mistake about it, we work hard and we spend time away from the family uh, and you will face some tough times. You may even find yourself in harm's way on a number of occasions or from time to time. Talk to them about those sorts of things. Don't, don't run from the truth. 
Uh, and whatever they ask you, be open and frank about it. Uh, recently, we made a trip down to the Gulf Coast, and we talked to three different recruiting stations. In each one of those recruiting stations, there was about 20 delayed entry persons, in each uh, one separately. And I will tell you that some of those folks, a lot of those folks, look to me like they could have just went straight to A school and out to the fleet. Uh, our recruiters are doing a tremendous job preparing them to go to basic training. They're motivated and they're ready. And I had that conversation with them. When we sat there and talked, I said, look, some of you, uh, I don't want there to be any false uh, impressions. You're going to go to basic training. You're going to go to your school. And we're going to send you to the fleet. And here's what you're going to do when you get to the fleet. And we talked about doing FSA duty. We talked about first lieutenant. You know, I told him I spent my first six months in the Navy stripping and waxing floors. You know, I said, that's the reality. Then we'll get you into your raid, and you'll work, and you'll learn, and so on. I said, but we are an uh, independent organization. We're expeditionary. We have to have the capabilities of doing our own work. So we talked about that. I talked about going into harm's way. Uh, I told them that there's a, there's a possibility uh, that while they serve, they may see uh, one of their friends not return from a mission type of scenario. Uh, and those sorts of conversations, we just have to be honest with them. You know what? When I was talking to them, there was a young lady standing next to me, and uh, we were talking about the sacrifice, the deployments, missing family, being away on the holidays. I talked to them about going out to the, the Fifth Fleet AOR for Thanksgiving, and uh, a young lady approaching to me in the mess decks with tears in her eyes asking me, you know, how do you deal with this, you know, year after year? Because she was missing her, her home. So we had a nice conversation. The young lady I was talking to, she started to cry, started tearing mm -hmm. up, right? Someone took a picture of it, and it ended up on social media. And somebody asked her why she was crying. And she came back, and she said, I was crying because my heart was swelled with pride in the opportunity that I'm going to have to make a sacrifice to our country. Right. So those are the kind of men and women that are signing up today. So I think the most important thing is be open and be honest and be frank with them. Uh, you're not going to scare them away. You're not going to drive them away because they want to serve. Okay. Great. Thanks. I'd like to add one thing to that if I can. The, uh, and I think there's another side to it, too, because when our young people are making, they're plotting their course in life, too. And, and there, there are some entitlements and some things they have out the MGI bill be one of those types of things right there. So they're looking at further education, so we can't forget that part's on there, too. And that makes joining the military, in some cases, you know, beneficial for the member when they come in. So I'll just throw that in for what it's worth. Sure. I was, uh, when, I think I mentioned earlier that I talked to a recruiter the other day uh, on the phone. We talked for about 15 minutes. And she told me that uh, she's got people that want to that wanna join that she can't put in because even though they meet the minimum requirements, uh, they can't put them in because they don't score high enough on the ASVAB or they don't have the, <laughs> the uh, physical capabilities to do some of the jobs that we need them to do. And they call her every day asking, is there an opening? Is there an opportunity? We've got, you know, some people will say, oh, it's because of the economy. Well, I was a recruiter in the late 80s, uh, and the economy wasn't doing very good then either. And we didn't see the numbers of people that are trying to enlist that we see today. So I think it's important to recognize that these young men and women are patriots first. Uh, of course, the benefit package is pretty nice, uh, but it's not the sole reason that they enlist. Yeah. I'm probably going to pay for this, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to let you know I've been all over in the Coast Guard, and we call overseas Alaska and Hawaii, but I've been everywhere. My daughter, she says, I've seen, including Arkansas, I always throw that in here, too, on a river tender. So I've seen a lot of different things. But you may or may not know that my youngest daughter is in the Navy. And she joined a sail, the sonar tech, and that's what she wanted to do. And she's going to, you know, and so I said, what do you want? Was, I've already seen the whole country. I want to see the world. I want to go sail and see it. So there's some folks out there who want to do that. So you might, it's, not, it's not all that bad. Mm -hmm. And she's really enjoyed it. She really enjoyed it. So there's people out there like yeah. that sea time. Thanks for the question, sir. <clears throat> second question? Okay. No, not yet. I do want a second question. All right. Morning, Matthews. First of all, thank you for coming. And I, I really appreciate your time. Um, Eric Kellum, I'm commanding officer USS Fort McHenry down at Little Creek. And uh, first of all, McPine, where's our video? I, yeah. <laughs> I didn't see a video, so we should have a video. Uh, and to answer your question, it's a fantastic time to be in the Navy. Um, so my, my, I guess, kind of comment and then question is, and I know you're tracking this, you know, we've had a lot of issues over the past couple of years with Manning. Uh, a lot of initiatives have been in place. I can tell you we're seeing the Manning on ships. 
um, at least at the E1, the E3 level. Um, I'm pretty much fully manned right now. Uh, we could argue about the schooling and, and how they're coming to us, but that, I know that's something we're trying to tackle. Your comment about leadership resonates very well with me, and my key leadership core on my ship is my mess. And uh, I have a phenomenal mess. There are a bunch of superstars, but right now I'm gapped 25%. Uh, I'm missing six chiefs. Um, I'm starting out in the basic phase, and I know that's something we're trying to do is to get the manning on. And I got that, and I understand at least my take over the last few days is that things will operate at a two to five to seven year pace. Um, I don't have time for that, Master Chief. I need, I need chiefs now. So what can we do to get the chiefs back in my mess so we can take care of those critical leadership stuff? Mm -hmm. Like what initiatives can we do now? Until it takes what 12 to 15 years to build a chief, but how can we fill those gaps right now? Can you can you speak to that at all? Right. So you've been around a while, Commander, and this isn't a new uh, challenge that we faced. And you know, a couple of years ago, we rolled out some incentives, initiatives to get C uh, chiefs to return to sea uh, early. Right. Uh, and it helps some, but as you just mentioned, we still have some challenges with getting chiefs to sea. When I was at Fleet Forces Command, our N1, our folks there, we kind of did a deep dive to find out where are these folks, right? And what we found is that there's some onesie twosies out there, but there's not this uh, cadre of folks that are hiding out on shore duty. Most of them that are on shore duty or, you know, come off of sea duty and they're, they're getting their normal seashore flow in, uh, or they're in some kind of limited duty status. And even when we looked at the limited duty status, there's not a whole lot of chiefs that are in that pool. There's a few, but certainly not enough to overcome the, 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 the deficit that, or the delta that you currently see. So short of buying more people, more chief petty officers, short of that, the only other thing that we can really do is continue to encourage those chief petty officers that have finished a minimum activity tour ashore to go back to sea. I'm not saying, again, that there isn't some folks out there that, uh, that we need to get back to see or there isn't some billets that uh, may not necessarily need to be filled by a, a shore filled by a chief, uh, but it's not at the numbers that would really change the, the equation. And so I don't have a good answer for your question. It's kind of all the above. Uh, so what I see is that we're just going to continue, you know, we'll continue to, to struggle or to deal with that issue for the foreseeable future, uh, especially right now with our, our budget challenges as well. So I'm not always, I'm not always going to put a, a, a good answer to a good question. I shouldn't say that. I'm not always going to give you the answer you're looking for, but I'll certainly tell you what I know. And right now, that is the challenge, sir. But it, it's, it's a legitimate question and a legitimate issue. Thank you. I guess I'm next. Um, this is for both the Master Chiefs. Uh, first off, Master Chief Ben Roth from uh, the headquarters unit here. Last year, about this time, we had a Navy Times article stating that uh, we were doing away with CCTI. Chiefs called it indoctrination. Can you tell me, obviously it didn't go away, but what's some of the changes that have been made since then and maybe uh, anything that for the, for the foreseeable future? Did you want to go first, or you want to? Did you? Have well, I guess I went. I'll kick it off. Yeah. Thanks, Master Chief. That's a it's a great question. See, it's really hard to answer just a few things. One of those initiatives underneath making sure that we enhance the leadership of the chief's mess was to change our CCTI process. Uh, we we had this thing called uh, the Kangaroo Court. I'm not going to go into all the details of it, of how the chiefs did business, but I came through the old days. Anybody standing in this room knows exactly what I'm talking about out there, but. We need to clean it up and make it good for 2020 and beyond. And, and I always had a problem with that when I went through that because I th always thought that when you advance to chief petty officer that the chief should be pulling you in there and teaching the things that chiefs are supposed to teach you, basically not hazing you in some sense. The other problem I had was with the uh, what we call the chief's creed. Uh, we, we, we changed the charge. But to get right back to the CCTI part of it, what we did is we took the, we took the, the kangaroo core portion out of it and, and that portion of it has been changed to a, uh, the senior leaders getting in there, along with some of our senior officers, along with our junior officers, and the chief petty officer, that new chief petty officer, is standing right alongside that junior petty officer, much of what the Navy does, and they're taking on these challenges together, and they're doing it in a, in a curriculum. They're doing it in a way that they can understand why these things are important, because at the end of the day, I think it just Captain Jones is sitting over here, and, I, and, and so when I talked to Captain Jones, we're both looking at the, we can both see the same 
the same challenges over the horizon. We can see them together, and that's where that starts is in that process. We also created nine PQS items in there, just items that we thought that I thought that, that the senior leadership at the Gold Badge thought it was really important. Some of those items were make sure you attend the Chiefs Academy, but but some of the challenges I run across is what's the captain's mission and vision? What's your commander's mission and vision? What's their intent? Because sometimes you see those disconnects out there. Uh, just, just between those two things, and you're supposed to be, the chief's mess is supposed to be supporting the command. What, what does the command want? And vice versa. I've had to deal with that on all different realms. And, and, and it just rolls all the way down. What's the, what's the commandant's goals? How can you help the commandant achieve his goals? How can you help the master pay off the ghost guard achieve their goals? Why don't we start thinking outside being a first class petty officer, knowing full well that we don't have the resources nor the time because they all got day jobs? We've got to make it realistic. So, so it's all kind of formed that way, but they're nine, and those nine we put in are very, they're time consuming in the six, eight weeks they have to get these things done. So that's been changed. Another part we changed is uh, that's been changed significantly. And like I said, the, uh, we made the cheese creed into a cheese charge. And, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's probably a section of it. I'm going back a little bit. Through the course of this process, you made this, you, you've been made to suffer indignities and humilities. You took, all these, you took all these things with very good grace and so on and so forth. And since you took all this stuff with very good grace, you're now part of the sisterhood and brotherhood. And so I had to ask a question, what do we got, a frat house going on out here? Because from the outside looking in, that's kind of what it reads like. We just need to clean it up and make it a little bit better. So we made a charge. And most important thing is when a chief petty officer gets lost, where can they go today to find out what their duties and responsibilities are? Well, then go to our new chief's charge. The second to last paragraph talks about, it talks about you're the fount of wisdom, the ambassador of goodwill, well, it's personal uh, technical applications, all that on. But it also says you set the tone, the positive example, all those different things. So look at yourself, chief, and we hold our chiefs accountable. So I'd ask the officer corps to take a peek at that. So you should know what they're doing. So there's a lot of other things in there, but that's the, kind of the basics of it. And Mick Pond and I work side by side with these types of things right here. So mm -hmm. I'll let you have the floor, sir. So we, I talked earlier about some of the challenges we face, uh, sexual assault, and sexual harassment, hazing. I didn't mention that earlier, but I'll mention it now. Hazing, uh, suicide. If you really want to get after these issues, then the training that you provide has to support it. You can't, you can't train one way and then that be counter to what you're trying to accomplish. So some of the training that we had done in the past uh, is counterintuitive to what we were trying to accomplish. I have to ensure that I have a process that's in place that treats everybody with dignity and respect and a process in place that provides everybody with a fair and equal opportunity to succeed. So if you, want, if you don't want people to engage in conduct or behavior that's unbecoming, then you can't have a training process that promotes that. <laughs> it just doesn't work. I can't, get a, I can't bring a new chief into training or a first class into training and be doing things like things that are counter to what we're going to ask them to do once they enter into the CPO mess. If I want them to be ambassadors of the Navy, if I want them to uh, uh, fight the challenges of hazing or sexual assault or those sorts of things, then I have to start in the training pipeline doing things that encourage them to do what's right. And so with CPO 365, about three years ago, we instituted that. We instituted a process where everybody is treated with dignity and respect and instituted a process where everybody has a fair and equal opportunity to succeed. Now, when you, inst when you institute change like that, and it goes against what some people call tradition, I don't call it tradition, but it's the way you've done things over a long period of time, uh, you're going to have some resistance. It's only human nature. And I had expected the resistance. Matter of fact, I probably would have been disappointed if I didn't get resistance, <laughs> right? But when you, heard, when you heard that the process had gone away, that was a disingenuous comment because what changed was the name, and the name matches what we're doing. But for the last three years, we've been going down this path of training in a CPO 365-like environment. Uh, it's the right thing to do. Our Navy has been evolving for over 237 years and will continue to evolve, and our chief petty officers have been a part of that for 120 of those years, over 120 years. And so to maintain relevancy, to, main sure, to ensure that we're able to provide the leadership that our sailors should expect and deserve from us, 
we're going to continue to evolve and change the process so that we can provide that leadership. So good question, Mass Chief. Thank you. One more question, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Magnus Leening. I'm the Swedish Navy uh, Naval Attaché. Um, I'm going to, I know, well aware of it, soon lunch here. Uh, <laughs> Sweden is doing a, a huge paradigm, a paradigm shift at the moment. We scrapped a three, four hundred year old conscript system to professional enlisted. Uh, we had about a 30 year experiment without senior enlisted and NCO. It was just conscripts and officers. If you could do it all again, if you could start uh, a new core, what would be your first guideline? What comes into mind uh, first? What would you do first? What would be your recommendation? Thank you. Well, I, I will share your CNO, your Chief of Naval Operations, uh, the last a few months back actually came to the office and visited with me. Was you there with him? No. I couldn't remember if you were. Uh, so he came over to visit and he asked me the same question. And I told him that you have to invite me to Switzerland to get the answer, right? So he did, right? So, uh, or Sweden, I'm sorry, uh, Switzerland. So uh, they don't even have an ocean, do they? But, uh, so he invited us over uh, in the summertime to have this particular conversation. And it's, a very, it's not an easy question to answer because a lot of it you answer, you know, in hindsight. Uh, and what's really made our Navy a great organization is all the trials and tribulations that we've faced. And when you take all that out of the equation, I don't know if you are who you, who you are today. Um, but I think we recognized, uh, you know, a few years back, actually before I came in, probably when, at the start of the all-volunteer force about 1972, we recognized the importance of leadership development and professional training. Uh, if I was to be able to go back and kind of redo some things, what I would do personally was I would institute a much more robust leadership training curriculum throughout a sailor's career. And we're just now, I, in my opinion, we're just now starting to get there. Uh, we are, I think we're behind in that particular area. It's got to start from day one and it's got to go all the way up through a person's career continuous leadership development because again if you don't have the right leaders in the right place then you'll never have the organization that you desire to have so that's where I would focus my efforts is in leadership development of course technical training is extremely important but all of all of it kind of revolves around our ability to provide leadership I can't share any more with you because I still want the trip right and if I do then they won't they won't send me so thank you Okay, Mick Pond, Mick Bog, thank you for some terrific presented responses to an active set of questions from the audience. But more important than that, I want to thank you for what you do for the hundreds of thousands of sailors and Coast Guardsmen who are out there every single day serving our great nation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Admiral. Appreciate it.